Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Cecilia Munoz, and I am super, super excited to be part of this event today. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I am here with uh, two of my colleagues who um, helped found the Public Interest Technology Project at New America, um, who do extraordinary work, each of them in their own right, and have had extraordinary careers. But most importantly, for this particular moment, they are co-authors of a book, um, Power to the Public, um, which is a book that focuses on um, public interest technology. It focuses on, and in this case, we're going to zero in on why data is really only as good as the people who are using the data. Um, it, this, this, I've, I've had the, the book is not out yet. It's coming out in April, um, but I've had the joy of, of um, both reviewing it and of watching these two authors at work. Um, both writing the book, but also doing the incredibly important work that they do, both for our public interest technology project at New America, and also something we call the New Practice Lab, um, which, uh, which Tara developed out of the uh, public interest tech work that we do. So um, welcome. I am really, really excited um, about this conversation, and uh, we hope that you are uh, eager to take part in it. Um, so I want to start by asking both of you, really, uh, it's a two-part question. Um, one, why did you write this thing? Uh, and and what, what is public tech, public interest technology anyway? Like what is, what is, what are we talking about and why are we talking about it? Um, so Hannah, let me turn to you first and then I'll, and then over to Tara. Sure. Um, so I'll, I'll take it. Uh, first, why did we, why did we, we write this book? Um, it's, Funny because when we first um, started this program, we had a lot of conversations about like, will anyone ever be interested in this topic? And how do we get these kinds of stories out there? And who's going to ever want to hear about government and technology and data and research and all that? Um, and little did we know um, that the world was suddenly going to have a, a pit moment, um, public interest technology moment, um, in part because of how much we rely on, we're relying on government in a crisis to deliver um, money and vaccines and things like that. So we are really um, in, a, in a moment here. Um, so, uh, we did obviously we started the book before all of that happened thinking we were and and then wrote it um during the pandemic um obviously and uh i think part of so we always sort of had in the back of our minds as part of this program that we would um start developing um uh books for the field um but i think what we were we were we needed an opening and we needed also for the field to be mature enough to have really good stories to tell. Um, so that was part of the impetus. And uh, I don't know, Tara, do you want to define the field? Yeah, yeah, I'll define the field as we talk about it in the uh, book as really a practice um, that is somewhat expansive and builds on other fields. Um, it really, we focus in on three elements of the practice broadly, uh, using uh, data to understand, real-time data to understand what's happening and if something is working, um, testing ideas, policies, programs with the people for whom they're designed. So you can call that um, user-centered research. Um, go, it's a practice we described that goes back to anthropological trade of really, or organizing, really understanding what motivates people and keeping a feedback loop between the people who you're serving um, and uh, leaders of programs and government officials. And the third piece, which is which is the most broad is really we and we found all the amazing leaders we interviewed were doing some semblance of this combination of three things and the third was that they had really cultures of learning they started small they tried something out if it didn't work they course corrected before they scaled it up in the kind of um, tech practices this would be a minimum viable product or, but but really the broader ethos was to try test see if it works and if it doesn't to stop doing that in course corrected. So um, these are the three practices we really talk about in the book. For me, on the reason, you know, I think Hannah and I ended up at a book length is that it took a little while to explain and we had done shorter versions of trying to make this work visible and the it's like a layers of an onion, the more you unpack it, it isn't, um, you know, straightforward. We and we wanted to have a chance to really unpack it with all the 
the layers that no app will end homelessness. This is this is more than a single piece of data. This is a practice in how you um, solve public problems. So a couple more foundational questions before we dig in. Um, what so? I mean, maybe there's an obvious answer to this question, but why now? Like, there, there's, it feels to me like we're living in a moment where what's happening in the world is shouting at us that we kind of need this field to really come into being and that we need practitioners to really be present in government and really make sure that we're delivering things for people. But like, what, what's, is, am I, am I right? Is this a, is this a good moment to be having a conversation about public interest tech? Hannah. Yeah. I don't know, Hannah, do you want to, I'm happy to start or let you go. Um, I think this is a, a great and also critical moment because, so I will tell a very brief story, which is that um, before this book, uh, we at the at New America, we put out a much smaller book called The Government Fix. Um, and I have a very longtime friend who has worked on Capitol Hill for her entire career, who came to this event um, where we talked about this book, which had um, some much smaller stories that we had that we had shared up until that point. And after the event, she said to me, I finally understand what you do. <laughs> um, so I think that it's like public interest technology is not a, it's not a phrase that rolls off the tongue. Um, it's not something that is actually easily defined. Anybody who works in it will I think can attest to that, that like, it's very hard to tell people at a party what you do. Um, but at this moment, all of a sudden, the entire country needs to interact with government. Um, so I think part of why it's been hard to explain it is that most people don't interact with government on their day, or they don't think about their interactions with government on a daily basis. Um, and all of a sudden, all of that is front and center. And we are seeing the results of, you know, we at the, at New America have been for a very long time saying something bad is going to happen and it's going to be really bad. Um, and I, you know, it's sad to say that like we are now at that moment um, that we were trying to raise awareness about, but um, on the plus side, all of a sudden now there's a lot of focus on like, oh, government not so good at delivering things to, you know, the way that you know we're used to having services delivered. So um, hopefully, this this crisis will not go to waste. Tara, this is an obsession with you, isn't it? Yes. Um, you know, it's been almost a decade since I worked on the implementation of the Affordable Care Act, um, which was in some ways one of the most high-profile failures before it was the one <laughs> the most high-profile successes in the nexus of policymaking and and delivery. But there are many groups, Beta NYC, Bloomberg, Code for America, who've been out kind of building the practice among the people who are in it here. And I think we really, for this moment, we felt like we there's a stride for the folks who are in the work and know what they're doing. But the, the work will not expand without getting to Hannah's friend on the Hill or the next layer out of chiefs of staff, a fresh turnover in state and federal government um, offices that whether you care about kids or you care about climate or you care about homelessness, that the practice of how you bring your ideas into the world is changing at such a pace um, that you know the, the crisis in particular does put this on display. I'd say Hannah and I in the middle of writing the book um, woke up and saw while, while things seem to be crashing and burning with unemployment sites in the United States and challenges having the government deliver basic information about whether you should or shouldn't wear a mask in the spring. Uh, I, I read the story in the New York Times about Germany where in 10 days, <laughs> dollars went out to gig workers and people described it as um, refreshing and seamless experience. And so it's a reminder that this isn't, this isn't easy work, but that it isn't rocket science. It is possible and around the world, some governments at moments really did deliver in a way that was different. And uh, we had similar stimulus checks um, and stimulus efforts here in the United States, but the last mile of making sure those reach people is mission critical. And I think part of what we're aiming to do is say policy is really important, right? What you decide to prioritize really matters, but whether it makes the impact is really about whether it reaches people, shots in their arms, stimulus checks before you lose your apartment 
And so um, we looked around and we tell a story about places that even in this crisis were doing things different and the government was really working. So um, to, to dive into the details a little bit, you make the case and I, I will say I, I, I read the book and uh, you know, I, maybe that I start out biased because I'm like the president of both of your fan club, but um, you make a really compelling case that the, the practice that you're talking about, the way this needs to work really depends on three things and they conveniently start with the same letter, design, data and delivery, like that's at the core. So I'd love to ask you to, to tell a story about each of those things, right? Help us understand why does design matter? What, what helps us illustrate why data matters? What, help, what can illustrate why delivery matters? And let's, let's start with design. Um, and, and Tara, you um, uh, tell a story in the book about, about Seville, about what happened in Michigan. Do you wanna talk about that? Sure, it's a really amazing story. Um, Sevilla is, is the small design organization nonprofit that grew out of um, a scrappy office in Tech Town, um, which is a city we're familiar with, part of Detroit. The, the work done by Sevilla really comes from a longtime United Way staffer named Michael Brennan, who spent 40 years of his career working on poverty programs. And in the course of this, he has a report commission showing um, the amount that the state of Michigan is spending on poverty programs. And there's a footnote in the report that mentions that Michigan has the longest application in the country for a series of public benefits. And Michael gets obsessed with the form and he prints it out, which takes nearly 70 pages. He tapes it end to end, becomes a huge scroll. He's the CEO at this point of United Way of Michigan. And and he, he rolls it out as a physical symbol of you need help, you need emergency food assistance, um, you need emergency cash, check out this nearly mile long form. And when you fill it out, that's actually only the first hurdle in us helping you. And he really saw for a moment that they were investing huge amounts of dollars, but that it didn't really look like help. And it's the, it's the, the charge that Michael and a new organization he forms to tackle this with a few Stanford D school designers to really investigate and learn from the frontline workers who um, adjudicate this form and from the people who are receiving a series of, of benefits in Michigan, how the process could be made better. And in the course of their project, which they call reform, they cut the country's longest application in half. They deeply listened to the public sector workers who had ideas about how to make this better. And they fundamentally transformed the access that people have to things like food assistance and Medicaid and really built a model of what um, delivery could look like. And the design, you know, you look at a form that's that long, it asked incredibly inhumane questions like, how many fathers does your child have? You know, it kind of been built over year over years by different pieces. It, um, it wasn't very effective at collecting data on the backside. Um, it wasn't really made for humans. And they talked to people about what it felt like to fill out this form. Um, they even gave um, the senior officials in the state of Michigan, after doing a bunch of user research and collecting data about how the form worked, they brought, they asked some senior leaders from the Michigan Health and Human Services Department to come to their offices for a briefing. And instead of having a memo or a slide presentation, they reenacted the experience of walking into a public benefits office. They, it was loud, it was noisy, they gave the officials clipboards, there weren't enough chairs for everyone, and they asked them to fill out this super long form. And it was very awkward <laughs> at first. They, they sat in silence. Many of the officials hadn't actually seen the form that they were the overseers of. And then they walked them through the experience of their own frontline workers in their work from a bunch of user research. And it was this kind of out of the box process um, where the state of Michigan decided they were going to collaborate with this nonprofit on the spot to redesign this form. Um, but it, at, the, at the essence, Cecilia, the design was not really made for humans, you know? And it's some, we have a lot of processes that, that are made, you know, without the final person in mind, maybe new rules and new questions and, um, and new processes conglomerate, but really returning for nonprofits and governments back to this essence of who am I serving? Who, who is it that's filling out this form? How tired are they? How much time do they have? 
how many days off of work would they have to take to execute us helping them with food assistance if they're an hourly wage worker? That really we try to animate um, the design of work that brings people back to understanding who is this designed for? And if it's aimed to help them, does it really feel like that? It's an amazing story. It is an amazing story. All right, Hannah, I'm gonna, just in keeping with the, the theme, um, I wanna ask you to talk about a delivery example. Um, sure. So um, we, so just to, cause delivery is kind of a weird word. Um, I will, especially for New Yorkers who have many things delivered. Um, I uh, just wanna um, clarify that how, how we, when we refer to delivery in the book, what we're talking about is really that last mile delivery of whether that's like a vaccine into an arm, um, money into a pocket, uh, how do people actually get the thing that they are, that government um, is offering them? Um, and uh, so in the book, one of the examples that we, um, one of the stories that we share, which has um, a great delivery piece, but also has a great um, piece around uh, how simple sometimes the, the fixes are. Um, so uh, Marina Nietzsche was previously the um, CTO at the VA um, at the federal level. And um, at the end of the um, Obama administration, she was rolling off and looking for her next thing. Um, and she had always been active in child welfare. She had been a foster parent. Um, she'd been involved with foster kids, um, even as a college student. And it's something that she cared a lot about so that she knew that was something that she wanted to work on. And she had the opportunity um, to work on the foster care system, the child welfare system in Rhode Island, um, which was one of the states with the longest um, backlog of uh, applicants for foster parents. Um, so she went in and her team mapped the process of, well, how do you become a foster parent? All these people are, so part of what the state was focused on was how do we get more people to apply and more people into the system because there weren't enough beds for in homes for children. Um, but once she started digging in, she realized actually this is not an issue about getting more people to apply. This is about um, there being a long waiting list of people who have already applied and have not been through the system so um, and have not been approved. So anybody who is familiar with government processes, this is a thing that comes up time and again, right, is the, the approval process for people. Um, so she did a deep dive into all of the steps. She, this was the first time this had been done. She mapped out all of the steps of um, what people had to go through for the approval process. And um, she discovered a few things that were blockers. The most significant being that um, there were two pages to a medical consent form, which had to be filled out. Um, and the first page, uh, and um, they were not, they were two loose leaf pages. And what happened time and time again was people would submit the first page and forget about the second page. And so their process, their application would be held up purely because they had not no, either noticed that there was a second page or hadn't submitted the second page. And so somebody had to call and ask them for the information. And um, the people who did the, uh, did the outreach to call them were not, um, sometimes it was confusing. They would call and say like, I'm just calling to verify the following information and not fully identify who they were. And so the families were confused. Um, so what they did to solve this was they stapled the two pages together. And um, I don't have the number off the top of my head, but that um, increased the number of people who were able to move past that step dramatically. Um, and one of the reasons that we tell that story in the book is to illustrate that a lot of the time, this is, it's just a question of having a holistic view of the process um, and going through step by step by step, 
um, to say, and why is this here? And is that legally required? And is that actually information that anyone does anything with? And this is it really needed? And is there another way to do it that could be faster? Um, so uh, Marina Nietzsche did all of that work and um, was actually able to clear the backlog in um, Rhode Island by having a, um, a weekend marathon where they sort of crammed all of the services into one room and just got people through when they were able to work through the backlog. Um, but the, the other reason that we share that story is that um, there's a her focus was on delivery. So it wasn't just enough to um, to say, oh, well, yeah, it takes a long time to go through the process. Oh, well, um, she looked step by step at why was everything necessary um, and had a real focus on de the delivery here being, um, how do we get parents, how do we get uh, more beds available? And the way to get more beds available is to have more parents who are uh, certified by the state to be foster parents. Um, and it turns out the holdup was a staple. So this is why we um, really emphasize looking at, not only looking at holistically at the process, but also looking at how does delivery actually work? And this is um, something that we also talk about um, in the book around the CARES Act, the first stimulus package, um, and how, uh, and that delivery was not a focus of um, the first stimulus package. And there are still people, I believe, um, Tara, you have, have more handle on this than I do, but um, I believe there are still people waiting for their checks. 10 million people are still waiting for their checks. Say the number again. 10 million Americans, the, um, while uh, over 95 million stimulus checks went out to the um, low-income Americans who don't make enough to file taxes. Uh, needed to take an extra step in order to get their check because there's no address on record for them to be mailed a check. And um, so arguably uh, 10 million of the folks who need the stimulus check the most didn't receive it. So this, this gets at a, a, a pet peeve of mine, which is that we think we won the victory when a policy gets passed, when a bill gets signed, as by the way, the American Rescue Act just got signed like in the last hour or so. And it is, not, which is not to say that that's not a huge victory and I'm very excited about it, but at the same time, we don't log the victory until the dollars reach the pockets of the folks in question. And as you know, the whole country is getting a lesson in, the vaccine strategy doesn't count as a successful strategy as in the success that we need it to have until it actually gets in people's arms. And that's about delivery. Um, but this is also, the, we're, so we're holding this event um, in, uh, coordination with Data Week. Um, and so I wanna talk about data, but, but before we get into that, I have been asked to remind everybody that um, we are live tweeting this conversation and you are welcome to join. You can follow at New America Pit. Pit is how we refer to public interest tech. Um, so feel free to join in the conversation on Twitter. Um, but let's talk about data. That is um, also essential to making sure that policy actually reaches people. Um, uh, I'm not sure which of you I was supposed to ask to chime in with a data story, but go for it. Uh, Tara, I think you're, are you doing it? I'm happy to. I think, you know, um, data is like the water now. So maybe just to define how we talk about uh, data in this book in particular, I think there's lots of important uses for opening data, for using data. Um, but in particular, we really saw profound impact when data is good enough, real time, and allows you to test interventions. And so, um, you know, one of our favorite examples is the team at Community Solutions, which is a network um, that works in communities across the country at tackling homelessness. They don't aspire to improve um, or reduce the number of people who are unhoused. They aim to get to zero. <laughs> And, um, they, and a key ingredient in how they do this with communities is there's a ton of data in analyzing homelessness. The federal government actually requires communities to spend upwards of $100 million a year on a massive data system called HMIS. Um, each community has to purchase it from 
private vendors. And yet there's also a once a year count of how many unhoused are in the country. And neither of these two things, it turns out, are really useful to help you understand the data you need to end homelessness. And the data-based intervention from Built for Zero um, basically said, it's not good enough to know if the rate is 1%. We need to know how many unhoused folks are here today and how many are here tomorrow. And ostensibly they create an almost, um, with a bunch of data protections, a by name list so they can see whether they're making progress. And the interventions that you might need if you're Tara McGinnis might be different from the interventions um, to become housed if you're Hannah Schenk. And so it isn't a rate, it's a set of people for whom um, your needs are served. So the way that um, Built for Zero creates ostensibly uh, works with their communities to build a system to sort of establish data hygiene on understanding the total population um, of unhoused by community. And then they work the list um, until it's zero. And to get to zero, you have to get up and get to zero every day because someone new is evicted and you're back at one. And so kind of assessing on this way really allows you to understand whether you are making progress. And also they really twin their data with um, what is a human-centered design, finding out what that person needs, what is the obstacle um, for them? Is it, um, you know, it may not be enough to have a house if you can, if you, what you really need is a job. We found, they found in the, in one community where they reached technical zero um, was that they, it was, it was access to transportation that was fundamental in getting, which might not be the first thing you think, um, but, but is something that you learn when you interview a bunch of um, unhoused individuals and families to see what their barriers are. So pairing kind of macro data about who's unhoused with important data about the needs, you know, about the needs of the individuals. And so, you know, this real time data monitoring, many, many social problems that we address, whether it's how many people in the United States have COVID to what is the rate of suicide, our general data collection happens a year, two years after. And so while it's incredible data that's available, um, gets rolled up at the state level to the federal level, if you want to get ahead on a rash of teenage suicides, if you want to tackle in real time the opioid epidemic, you need to know what's happening now in your communities. And it's imperfect and there's ways to make sure that the data really represents um, everyone. It's part of the reason you need to go out as Built for Zero does and talk to people because um, data just on a list can, be, uh, can lead you really far astray as we find in other examples and who gets left out or who's overrepresented in data. Um, we talk about a great deal, um, uh, the kind of structural assumptions on race and gender and class that are baked into data can really read you, read you quite far astray if you only look at numbers on a chart without actually asking people what they need, but twinning this kind of real-time assessment, how many people are unhoused um, with an understanding of the, the communities and individuals that you need is uh, was really trans a transformational intervention for community solutions and dozens of communities are getting to zero and, and something that I think some people believe is impossible when it comes to the persistent challenge of homelessness. Thank you. So that um, what you just said speaks to um, a question which showed up in the in the Q and A, and I want to invite uh, our participants to feel free to ask questions. You can use the Q and A. You can use the chat function. We are keeping track of them, and I want to. I'm going to do my best to um, to ask whatever um, whatever you all want to ask. Um, but so the, the question that came in um, relates to structural racism and it sounded like it resonated, Tara, when you told the story about the 70 page benefits application in Michigan, um, whether or not that structural racism plays a role here. The example that you just gave with respect to um, uh, uh, addressing the needs of people who are unhoused also kind of referenced that there are some, some racist assumptions that sometimes get made. It's like how, how much of this is, how does structural racism play in here? And are, are there ways that the strategies that you guys are recommending address it? So one of the things that um, <clears throat> we talk about in the book and Tara just alluded to um, is that it's not enough to have, like a lot of places have data. It's not enough to have, just have data um, in order to really understand the why. This is the, the data will tell you the, the what, but 
to get to the why um, re requires actually going out um, into the community and talking to people. Um, and one of the, um, so I will say that we have discovered that there um, is structural racism embedded in, I, I mean, I think the world has also <laughs> discovered it along with us, but um, in some of our work, we digging into, for example, um, unemployment insurance, um, that there are, uh, there is structural racism baked into how decisions get made around um, who should get help and who shouldn't. Um, and so one of the pieces, one of the benefits of going in and actually engaging the community and talking to people and um, unpacking all of the pieces that, um, that make up the larger system and asking why at every single point um, is a way to, at the very least, start to um, you know, extricate some of the, the structural racism that has been baked into so many of our systems. Anything you wanna to add, Tara? Yeah, I mean, I think this is where, um, you know, who's curating the data and are they members of the community um, you know, we, we, from which the, the data is being assessed. Oh, there's an incredible book um, of it that details exactly how uh, communities of color and low income Americans show up more in data sources. So if you were mining for certain things, then, you know, wealthier communities um, may privately pay for public services. So that if you, if you um, are trying to establish uh, sense of who's in and who's out and who's counted and who's monitored, um, that there are tr tremendous assumptions baked in based on race and class. I think the unemployment insurance really resonated for me. If you're working on unemployment insurance and you were unable to dis disaggregate the data by race, you would, you know, we saw over the past summer that, um, that Black and Latinx workers were overrepresented in the unemployment data and dramatically underrepresented in the Americans who were receiving unemployment insurance. Um, but you wouldn't, you know, you couldn't see that if you just looked at across at unemployment insurance. You really need as a state system to understand, wow, for every, um, you know, uh, white applicant applying for unemployment insurance, um, we are getting fewer through who are actually receiving it. Some of that, as Hannah said, goes way back to program design about which workers were cut in and out of the the social policy from the beginning, but some of it comes down to, to default certain last names that auto automatically trigger, you have a hyphenated last name that auto automatically trigger a second look on the back end of a public data system. And so the importance of being able to see how a program, how a policy, how even a community or organization is serving people, um, the, the data aspect of, of understanding whether it's working for the average person may tell you nothing at all about how it's working for Latinx men. And so it's incredibly, it's both a tool that can be used to advance under, our understanding of the inequities, but I think could be used in a way that weaponizes um, uh, you know, baseline assumptions. And I think we, we spend a lot of time teasing out um, that it is only as powerful as the, as the measured nature and understanding of the folks who are using reading um, and analyzing the data, as well as who's in and who's out. So, so that question I should have said came from Kenneth, and we have another data-related question from Ashley. How do you balance asking or adding questions to find out what people need without making the process even longer for the people who are trying to apply for assistance? Oh, look at the, the big, big smiles as that question comes up. <laughs> well, we uh, I think we're just having some back and forth about a form today, so. <laughs> Uh, so as the resident uh, UX designer person, I'm always uh, against adding, I'm always like, is that, so this absolutely necessary? So um, there, there is, of course, always a tension between getting the information that you need and like getting any information at all. So you know that the more questions that you add, um, the less, the fewer people are going to be able to complete whatever it is that you're filling out. But when we're talking about um, government asking questions. Um, I've, my, my experience has been that, um, and I think that this holds up also just from the examples in the book, um, it's worth questioning every single 
question that government asks. Um, there are a lot of reasons, there are, government is old and we talk about this in the book too, government is old, our structures are old, our, our forms are old. Um, the information that we needed to process something 50 years ago is probably, that's probably not the same information that's needed today. Um, so the, of course the ultimate goal for most processes and it's this isn't workable for all government processes, but um, just speaking sort of globally about processes is the, um, the ultimate goal is for them to be invisible. So the thing you need shows up because somebody knows you needed it and it's just there. Um, so every question that you add in, so if you think about like, so that's a distance of zero between what the person needed and what they received. Um, and every question that you add increases that distance. So um, I think people need to think really carefully and also really dig into why is this being asked? Is that a legal requirement? Where does it specify that it's a legal requirement? Who actually is doing something with this information? What are they doing? Um, are they doing something that maybe is should they shouldn't be doing? Or maybe there it opens the door for uh, structural racism and for racist practices. Um, so those are all good questions to ask. Um, and I, I know we, we're going to move on, but I did want to just circle back to the last question for a second um, and say that uh, the fact that there is structural racism baked into so many of our systems um, is also why it is critical that um, teams be diverse and that especially the people who are looking at the data and, and um, collecting the data and analyzing the data must include people from the community um, who, and must include diverse viewpoints because all data is not, you know, you think you have a number and it's, there are only so many ways of looking at that number. Um, that is, it turns out to not actually be true. Um, and we, in the book, we tell a story um, from sexually a New York, story um, about rat abatement. Um, and this may be a story that people in this audience already already know, but I, um, and should I wait or should, is it okay to go into it? Yeah. Okay. Um, this, is, this is one of our, our it, well, and I will say it's my mom's favorite story. So um, I just use that as a bellwether of like, that's a good story to tell. Um, uh, so um, New York City was looking to do rat abatement, um, and in order to do that, um, they looked, this is the, um, I believe the MODA team, um, the uh, Mayor's Office of Data Analytics, looked at um, the 311 call, the calls from 311 to see where the date, where the rat complaints were, and they mapped that data onto a map of the city. And the um, somebody who is in the office of in, in the Moda office, um, Aman Aman Ra Mashariki, um, who I believe was one of the early data analysts, um, looked at that data and he did the thing that a lot of people do would do when looking at a map of the city. He looked at his neighborhood. Um, and he saw to see like, well, how bad are the rats in my neighborhood? Like I live there, I know what the rat problem is, but I'm curious to see, you know, how is it represented by 301 data? Um, and according to 301 data where he lived um, in Bed-Stuy did not have a rat problem. Um, and he, the, well, the, and actually I should say, um, he'd grown up in um, public housing there. And so he looked specifically at the public housing the, there was no public, there was no rat problem in public housing. He still is in the neighborhood or at the time he still lived in the neighborhood. So he um, also looked at the larger neighborhood and thought, uh, this is weird. Like I definitely have seen rats. So uh, on my way to work. Um, so why are, why are there no rat calls showing up on the 301 data? And then he called a friend in uh, who still lived in the housing project, um, a friend of his from childhood and said, uh, so no more rats, <laughs> all, the, all the rat problems all gone there. And his friend was like, what are you talking about? Of course there are rats. And he said, well, then how come you never call 301? And his friend said, what's 301? Um, so I think what we learn from that is it's really important 
that somebody from the community is involved in parsing the data, um, particularly when you are looking at something that is community-based and location-based. And we know now that three-on-one data is biased to certain communities, um, but that was sort of an early instance of why it's so critical to um, have a diverse data team. So I love that story too. Um, and we have more questions that are along this theme about the connection between racism, between structural racism and the data. So this is an anonymously sent question, which is how do you put policies in place to root out the kind of inherent racism that you see in data? We, um, I think we'll offer some learnings from our uh, from the folks we interviewed and spoke to, I also think this is a this is a live experiment, and there won't be one single clear cut path. We're going to need to try, test, and improve. You know, I think a couple of the a few simple basics. One, check the sources, just as you saw with three one one. If if our entire understanding of a problem comes from a single data set, we should really scrutinize the making of the data set. Two. Um, the, the analysis, even is who's questioning this, represent, being representative of, the, of, of communities engaged. And three, I think we would strongly caution against anyone use, going exclusively down the road of data alone or design alone or of a learning culture. You need to use these three things together. So the data is only as useful, but you should take the big data and then go talk to 10 people and see if it if it shakes, 10 represented people, see if it shakes out. And so that practice of both using data, but really testing the assumptions in a, 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 with folks who are represented by a single digit in a spreadsheet um, is the third kind of piece of advice. And if you're doing all three of those things, you have a higher degree of discovery of what might be baked in and unseen and unrepresentative. So an, we have another anonymous question also in the same vein. So at one point in the conversation, we've said that there's that th there are ways in which data can be inherently racist. We know government systems can be racist. Um, so how do you make changes without changing the actual systems? Like, is it is it possible to make changes uh, if the if the overall structure hasn't changed? Is it possible to make progress and reach the people that we want to reach? You know, I, I think that we're in a, I mean, we talked about that Pitt is having a moment and I, I, maybe this is hopelessly naive, but I do think that we are in a moment where everything is up for grabs um, in terms of systems and processes. And I think that that is partially related to just where we are as a society in terms of how we expect things to function. Um, that has changed dramatically in the last ten, five to 10 years, um, just in terms of like everything's online now. That that didn't happen, before. and not only is everything online, but um, when things are online, you expect stuff to happen very quickly. Um, and you expect a certain amount of rigor, um, I think. Uh, so I, I think that we are in a, spot where you know there was sort of this revolution in the late 90s um early 2000s where things were starting to be digital and we're now at another place um and i, I also just want to add on the on the data piece I'll, I'll echo what tara said which is um that we're kind of in a brave new world when it comes to data there is suddenly publicly available data that didn't exist before. Massive, massive amounts, um, scary amounts in some ways. And there are for sure gonna be missteps. Um, and one of the things that we are looking at at New America is how to um, elevate the ethical use of data and create some kind of ethical pause or ethical raise, ethical impact statement or whatever it is, but um, to how to insert ethics into the practice of public interest technology. And I don't think that like that hasn't been figured out. We're still figuring out the, 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 the practice. Um, so there are for sure gonna be missteps. Um, I think that um, 
it's fair to be concerned um, that something might go very badly. Um, and I think that we also know um, in part because this conversation about structural racism and racist policies has been elevated and people are having it openly. Um, so I think there is some hope that at least by keeping that conversation alive, um, it opens the door for people to say, oh, actually this process that we've had in place for a hundred years needs to be rethought. Thank you. So I want to dig in a little bit to the, this. We've, so we've talked about design, data, and delivery. I want to dig into kind of pu public interest tech as a field a little bit because you a part of what this book really is about is kind of making the case for um, why it should be a field, why it needs to be strengthened, and how that might happen. But I'd love for you to disentangle for me, because there's a variety of different terms. Public interest tech is kind of a relatively new term, but there are other terms which get at similar themes. So can you, and maybe Tara, I'll ask this of you, um, civic tech, gov tech, public interest tech, like, are they all the same thing? Are they, how do they, do they differ? Like, what, what do they stand for? Um, I think we, we make the case they're not all the same thing, but you may think of them in kind of a growing family tree of some of them birth. Um, you know, I think civic tech birthed a, a bunch of this work. Some people associate more strongly with one of these affinity groups. And aim of our book is to kind of say, actually, there's a group of people, some of whom associate not at all with any of these terms, but are just the person in the basement of the police department who sits on the data and said, city who's just trying to use it for, to problem solve, who feel no affiliation with any um, annual conference, but that there is kind of an army of public problem solvers, some who um, have emerged out of a real focus on making data open and accessible, some who were their government partners um, who uh, saw, wow, we've now been First, we didn't want to make this data set public, but now that we've cleaned it up, it's very useful for us for our own um, management piece. A bunch of companies that have grown up to help um, governments that are struggling with this. Um, so I think we we isolate civic tech, gov tech um, into different um, kind of streams in a larger river, but we really think for the change that we need um, to be in service of citizens around the world. Uh, we're hoping people can see each other, can share practices, and think of themselves under broader tent, and that if we are really successful, the term public interest technology will be irrelevant, that this will just be how we do solving public problems. Hannah, I don't know if I've tackled that, but please pile on. Um, yeah, well, I think that the first step to having a thing is naming it um, and drawing a circle around it. And so the effort to name it public interest technology and that there, we also at New America, and I don't think we, we go into it a little bit in the book, but not really. Um, we have a whole other piece of our work, which is um, the uh, uni our university network and trying to um, just stoke the pipeline and also create an academic field that is called public interest technology. So um, there is that piece, which is like, maybe it's an actual academic field. Um, and uh, to that end, maybe that, you know, grows out of, growing out of an, it, it's not unusual, right? That you would have economics as um, an academic field and then it permeates um, the, and that's probably a terrible example because I don't know the history of economics. Um, but <laughs> um, the point being that, you know, this is a case where we're looking to have some interplay between um, how people get trained to be public servants um, and public interest technology. And I think that just to echo Tara's point that um, there is a hope that maybe it doesn't even like the name isn't a thing that will stick around because it's not needed because this is just how you solve public problems. Amen to that. So that, um, so let me, first of all, remind folks that we're having this conversation on Twitter as well. So you can join us um, and follow at New America Pit. Also invite people to ask, to continue to ask questions either through the chat or through the Q&A. And thank you to Kate who has just asked whether we do a podcast because she could listen to you all day, which makes me so happy. Um, 
But getting to this, um, so you talked about Hannah about the public interest university network, which um, which uh, New America and our colleague Andrine Soli uh, coordinates, helps run. Um, and the, our CEO, Anne-Marie Slaughter, likes to draw an analogy, acknowledging that it's not a perfect analogy, but that, it, that it was, it's been useful in kind of framing the concept that um, of kind of matching public interest tech to public interest law in the sense that there used to be a time where you went to law school, you worked for a corporation, you worked in the government, you worked at a law firm. And then because of investments from, from civil society, we kind of created and investments by government, we created a field of public interest law. And now it's a thing you can study and like grow up and do. And then you can, you know, work at the NAACP and be a, a public interest lawyer and, you know, use the law to help make policy, help drive policy, to help make the country a better place. I think that I, I like, it's not a perfect analogy, but I like that analogy because I think one of the things that we're trying to do is kind of create the market in government for people to use this skill set, the technology skill set, to solve public problems in the way that you're describing. And one of the challenges is um, that, I mean, that we've worried about the notion that government can never compete with industry for the talents of the technologists that we're talking about. Um, can, you, can you talk about that a little bit? Like, do we have a shot at, at bringing this kind of talent into government when everybody can just go work for Google and make five times as much? Um, so it's kind of fascinating to me, actually, that people, um, we've been doing a lot of interviews with the vaccine rollout, and one question that um, I get all the time is, like, who would go, who would turn down free lunch and stock options and the, you know, the cachet of saying they work for some startup or Google or wherever it is to say that, um, you know, they work at, <laughs> they, they work in policy at health and human services or whatever it is. Um, like that doesn't sound like a, uh, not to, <laughs> not to rain on everybody who, um, who, uh, who's with me, who has worked on policy in um, HHS, it's but uh, <laughs> what's that? <laughs> Sorry, oh, and I as co-authors, I play the role of like policy nerd. It's harder than you think. Some people actually sign up for it. Cecilia and Hannah, you know, this is our blend. Yes, yes. Um, so, uh, yeah. So I get this question a lot. Like, who would turn down the money? How can you? How can the public sector ever compete with the private sector when we're talking about technology? Um, and that was the question, so I was at the United States Digital Service um, in fairly early on, and that was also the question when they launched um, USGS, it's like, who would ever do this work? Who's ever gonna leave their cozy stock options? And I, I think that, um, that, first of all, there is a, there's a fundamental misunderstanding of the public sector and how great it is. <laughs> Um, as somebody who I spent the majority, you know, 20 years in the, in the private sector, um, and, uh, yeah, the, like, the, the offices are better, um, and, okay, yes, there are free meals, um, but, like, I think if you want to, if, if for people who want to do work that they feel like, um, makes a difference and has a really big impact, like, those people are always going to be drawn to government. Um, the issue is finding places for them. Right now, there's a real problem with there not being enough technical roles and enough places for tech fluent people to come into government. Um, we're actually seeing right now, um, USDS has been completely swamped with applications. They have far more people than they can um, process efficiently. Um, so many people are raising their hands right now to say, please let me help the country. Um, I think in part because the government failures are so, the government technical failures are so obvious right now. Um, but, you know, government has a long history of, um, of being a place where the smart, uh, ambitious people went to work. Um, that was before the, the, our present moment um, when government is kind of seen as like, why would you go there when you could go to Google? Um, but people for a very long time have answered that 
question with, you know, they have, they're internally motivated. It's more valuable to them to spend their time in government. So I, I don't think like, yes, the, the difference between salaries is bananas right now. Um, and maybe bigger than maybe the gap is bigger than it's been in the past, but, um, there are still people who are really invested in their communities and who want to do, do good work for them. Um, so, um, let me maybe ask a larger pit question, but actually I'm noticing in the comment, Alan just uh, pointed out that the ruined housing markets in coastal metros make it hard for someone to choose work based on meaning rather than money, which is, I, I think, a very good point, um, right? Because you need to be able to afford stable housing, especially if you're early in your career. I would just also say that so there's the federal government and, and as Hannah said that there are, you know, there are opportunities and people are flocking to them because they're interested in making a difference. But city and state governments are also a place where we need pit, right? It's the states right now which are implementing vaccines and in some cases it's the counties. Um, and it's states which are implementing unemployment insurance and the states failed really, really badly. Um, in getting those resources to the people who need them. And some of the most exciting innovations are happening in cities around the country and not even necessarily the largest metro areas, um, but even in small cities. So there's, I think the truth of the matter is that we need public interest tech everywhere in government. Um, and that, I mean, that's not only on the coast, but it's everywhere in the country, right? Because some of the most important interactions that people have with their government happen locally. So that's just another um, uh, focus of activity that I wouldn't take off the table. But let me ask a general pit question and I realize that we're rounding the corner on the hour. We wanna keep the conversation going, but I'll, I'll kind of keep an eye on it and we'll um, continue it a little bit. Um, uh, but we recognize that everybody's committed time to this and we're grateful for you. Um, so pit, as Hannah said, is having a moment. Um, when we um, started the, public interest tech program at New America now more than four years ago, we wondered how we might ever get a story about policy design or government tech international publication. And like all of a sudden it's kind of everywhere. Um, so Tara, do you wanna talk about, um, about like the moment that Pitt seems to be having and why that might be? I think in some ways um, the crisis has really pushed us to a moment where people, Hannah and I take a strong stance in the book that there is no solving the world's hardest problems without governments, period, full stop. That there's critical roles for nonprofits and private sector players, but that um, we still need city, state, county government. And I think if there were ever a time we looked around and picked up a newspaper and saw that it is your local county health officials who let who are keeping track at the first cut of data of who has COVID, um, that it's a time when millions of Americans lost their jobs and we do have a social insurance program through unemployment insurance, um, that, that in some ways the, in, in high and happy times, although frankly for many of us, um, the crisis was brewing before the pandemic, uh, when it comes to income inequality and structural racism, but in high and happy times, I think it's easier not to see the purpose of government. And we are not in a moment, I think anywhere in the world where you don't see the purpose and role of government. And I think part of that has helped made the focus on how do the emergency benefits, the help in the flood and, um, and you know, and weather that we saw uh, and power outages around that in Texas, that the course of need um, for these things which we as citizens can't do alone is on display and therefore making the work of delivery visible. The package that signed into law today, the American Rescue Plan, will have, a, if implemented well, will cut um, child poverty in half by making sure that everyone who could get a child tax credit can access it, by making sure that funds move quickly to the states, which are trying to um, uh, make schools easier to access and bring internet to places where schools are still not a safe place for our kids. So I think that the, you can't look at a single facet of life and not see that there's a, a role for government and particularly in that last mile of how you reach people in meaningful times in crisis. And that has really helped accelerate attention on a bunch of these um, projects. 
So um, d does that make you hopeful? I mean, that that um, on the one hand, Pitt is having a moment and there's a lot of conversation about it. On the other hand, a lot of the conversation is about like, oh, government failing again and can never get it right. I mean, you both strike me as, look, you've both been public servants. You've both worked in government. Um, you are kind of believers in what government can do and evangelists a little bit for, uh, for people to do this work in government. But you've also seen this moment of crisis where like, where there's more meaningful news about government not getting it right than getting it right. Like, are you optimistic about this moment and about what lies ahead? And maybe we'll make that the closing question. So let me turn to you, Hannah, first. Um, I I am optimistic. I, I uh, read an article in the in the Times. I think it was um, this morning about the, um, the the bill that just passed and how this is really a return to um, big government in which certainly I growing up in the eighties and the nineties big government, like they're bad, very bad. <laughs> um, so, but this is sort of a return to um, these big signature programs like social security that were, you know, these programs that are developed to meet a specific population's need. Um, and I think that the fact that some, a bill like that could pass, uh, the, you know, the one that t today's bill could pass, and 70% um, of the country supports it. Um, I think that we are at a place where um, more and more people are seeing the role and especially coming off of the last four years where we didn't have, where we didn't have an interventionist government. Um, we are seeing um, that there's a real appetite, I think for people need help. Um, people need help and that they're not equipped, that they can't give themselves, they can't devise their own, you know, they can't, you can't like mix up a vaccine in your basement. Um, you're not going to be able to, the, uh, the um, child tax credit was the big news, I think, um, in, this, or in this piece that I was reading. Um, those are, you know, lifting children out of poverty isn't something that, like, sometimes people need help. Um, and Certainly, we are, yes, big believers, but I think that the confluence of people, possibly more people than ever, really, really needing government right now, um, combined with the fact that we are in this moment where we have all of this um, tech capability, um, and we also really understand the value um, at least in Pitt, and this is, I think, why this is a very important moment for this book, we understand that to really solve people's problems, um, you need to really understand them deeply. Um, and that it's not just like, oh, well, here's the money, let's throw it at the door and see what happens. Um, not to, again, I am not the policy person in this conversation, so not to diminish past policy practices, um, but that there is a real a real need and a real understanding and also these new tools. Um, so I think that we are in a very exciting moment. And yes, there is a lot of failure. There's going to be a lot more failure. Um, people still don't know how to, the private sector fails constantly when they build tech tools. It just doesn't make the news because who cares? Because um, it's, you know, people aren't going to like, people aren't going to starve because the private sector couldn't get their burrito delivery app functioning. Um, not to knock the private sector. <laughs> oh, I'm just, I'll just stop talking. <laughs> Thank you, Anna. Like Hannah, I'm oh, oh. incredibly optimistic. That doesn't mean that we're not clear eyed. I mean, we talk a lot about how long, how this is long work doesn't happen in a single gesture. It's the work of crisis and culture change and takes place over time. But we really, we wrote the book because we deeply believe that there are millions of people out there who are working in all different types of jobs um, with, an, with an approach like this that could actually solve problems. And we know that that's possible because we found a few <laughs> who really are making profound impact on things that were inconceivable. Um, and so we really, we hope that uh, we wrote it to get 
out of the of the number of people that we capture and uh, in an elevator or in our family meals or in extended um, visits to say like it's working and you can make it work and you can be a part of this in some way and it and if you are a designer you can be a part of this if you are a policy expert you can be a part of this you may be a back you know working in the back end of a processing um, uh, effort as a public servant but you can be a part of, of of the change that makes things possible and so we are it was incredibly inspiring when the world was falling apart this past year to interview people who were putting it back together and really showing results. And I think Han and I took a lot of refuge for that uh, in that. And if you look, I myself would not have said three months ago that 18% of the United States would be vaccinated and 40% uh, you know, folks would have an uh, herd immunity. That there are signs that when we pull this together, we try new things and we admit when it's hard and try again, that we can fix things. And I hope folks, we know we're speaking to an audience of fixers and designers and doers on the data front. Um, we really just hope everyone will spread the word that it is possible and it is everybody's work. Thank you. So I'm gonna, there's one question that I'm just gonna answer really quickly from Anonymous is asking whether this field is a pathway from urban informatics programs. And the answer to that is yes, an emphatic yes. Um, right, that speaks to the whole question of data as one of the keys to this new kind of practice. Um, and there are places you can read more about this, most importantly, uh, by getting a copy of Power to the Public and the, uh, a link to the book is in the chat. Um, new America also does a publication called The Commons at wearecommons.us, which is um, a place where you can find stories about public interest technology, um, and in all of its various dimensions, it has a loyal uh, and, and wonderful following. Um, you can see also in the chat a way to uh, subscribe um, to uh, Pitt Universe, which is the newsletter of the Public Interest Technology University Network. There are lots of resources here. Um, uh, and we, it feels tremendously important as we try to build this field for us to stay um, connected to each other. So we really, really appreciate everybody joining us for this. Congratulations, Hannah and Tara on the book. Um, uh, I'm excited to see it go out into the world, but especially excited and hopeful about what this work represents for all of us. So thank you all very much. We're gonna close it off here. Thank you, Hannah and Tara. Congratulations, and we will see you all again soon. Thank you so much.